All right, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. I'm very excited about this panel today with our Wilder faculty. Uh, my name is Lauren Levy, and I am the Senior Coordinator of Alumni Engagement Events with the Office of Alumni Relations. I graduated from the VCU L. Douglas Wilder School with a Certificate in Nonprofit Management in December of 2019, and I'm very excited to be here today uh, to talk about COVID's impact on healthcare preparedness and policy. Thumbs up if you can hear me, and please feel free to use the reactions below throughout the discussion and share your questions in the comments. We're gonna do our best to answer as many as we can. So first, I would like to introduce Dr. Sarah Raskin. She is an assistant professor at the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs, where she teaches public health, emergency preparedness in the Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Program, as well as the urban health in the urban planning program. Dr. Raskin is a medical anthropologist who examines social, contextual, and ethical determinants of health problems and healthcare access and use among historically marginalized populations. She seeks to instill the value of importance and importance of listening in the lives of her students, the next generation of scholars and engaged citizens. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you. And next, we also have Dr. Katherine Howell joining us today. She's an assistant professor from the Urban and Regional Studies Program at the L. Douglas Wilder School for Government and Public Affairs. She's also the co-director of the RVA Eviction Lab. Dr. Howell investigates ways to inter interrupt ongoing patterns of migration, displacement, and segregation in cities. Her work fo focuses on affordable housing and public spaces to explore redevelopment, displacement, and government governance. Thank you for being with us today, Kate. So let's get right into our first question. question. Which populations will take the hardest hit during the pandemic and why? I'll let, Kate, do you wanna start with that? Um, sure. Um, I think, you know, I'll take it from a housing perspective because uh, obviously that's that's really where my, my work is. And then I'll have, I'll let Sarah take on the health aspects of this. Um, but, you know, if you look at, um, you know, who's, being impacted, right? It's, it's those who are already impacted by existing crises in affordable housing. And so we already see from previous research that um, uh, minority communities are most heavily impacted by eviction uh, and displacement, housing insecurity. Uh, and so these, uh, the job losses, the um, instability of income, they're gonna hit these populations even harder. And so those that were already on the margin in terms of housing stability are going to be really, really struggling now um, because they maybe their hours were cut and they were already paying a little bit too much for rent uh, because that was what was available. We have a housing shortage in Virginia. Um, and so now I think they're really going to be str struggling. And so those are, again, largely um, communities of color, particularly African-American and Latinx communities uh, across the state. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sure, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to kind of practice what I preach, which is following the best practices of crisis and emergency risk communication, which is to say, I don't know all the answers and information is changing very quickly. So I will try to give you the picture from where I sit today on April 20th, 2020. Um, so we can kind of differentiate the different kinds of hits. And Kate has already talked about one of the social hits, which is really the hit to housing stability among people who might be losing wages, have an inadequate safety net, et cetera. Um, we can also talk about the physical hits that are being taken during the pandemic, because those are um, clearly um, you know, what we are aware of right now so far as who is being infected, the degree of symptoms, whether they are asymptomatic all the way through um, uh, really um, profound and long-term symptoms that are increasingly seeming to be kind of multi-system. It appears that maybe there are some renal effects, you know, kidney effects of COVID as well as the respiratory effects that, effects that we're aware of. Um, and then all the way, unfortunately, through death, including both deaths that we know are the direct result of COVID-19, as well as those deaths that have not yet been counted because maybe someone for example, had a heart attack 
before they had a test, but it appears that it was likely attributable to COVID-19. And as Kate was saying, it's predominantly, and uh, it's predominantly um, racial and ethnic minorities, in particular, um, black and brown people who are experiencing the worst effects of COVID-19 so far as really profound health conditions, um, you know, terrible symptoms all the way through deaths, etc. Um, and we're also seeing those effects among people who are unable to physically distance themselves. And this is really a kind of mapping together of both of those categories of people. So whether it is, um, you know, essential workers. So when we think of both um, um, healthcare workers who are essential, of course we include clinicians, but are we also including people like uh, the janitorial staff or the administrative staff, people who have to report to work often in low wage job categories that are disproportionately populated by people who are black, brown, of lower educational stand, uh, status, et cetera. A similar example are public transit workers. Um, and then finally, I also want to call attention a bit here to gender. Um, there was recently, just today actually, um, an article uh, in the New York Times published about the vast majority of essential workers being women, that one of every three working women today works in a essential worker category. And so they are um, at disproportionate risk of being infected because of their exposure, because they have to report to work. Um, but also they are more likely to not have access to health insurance um, and, and some other things that we can talk about later in today's panel. Absolutely, thank you. And how would you say that this crisis is exasperating inequalities that exist in our society? Which one wants to start? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think, I think this is one of the things that a crisis does is it exposes um, the sort of gaping holes, <laughs> in our case, in our social safety nets, in our policy, in our governance. And um, for us, I think, uh, particularly across the Commonwealth, um, you know, we've had, as I mentioned before, house, an affordable housing shortage. Um, and we knew that going in, right? We knew that um, from, because we've looked at, at least at the RBA eviction lab, we've certainly looked at uh, Virginia's housing shortage. Um, you know, we've got 30 available units for every very low income, or extremely low income household who needs them, every 100, excuse me. So you have 30 units for every 100 households who needs them at the very low income levels. And so we were already kind of at this really um, unstable space for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we weren't putting money into affordable housing. We don't have local, um, really a whole lot of local rent assistance. We don't have a whole lot of um, affordable housing funding. We don't have sort of these, these kinds of pieces that can help us work it through. And then more importantly, we don't even have sort of the infrastructure to get money out the door and to people, right? And so um, from an emergency assistance perspective, we're really struggling and we don't have the, the expertise on the ground all the time to really um, start to think through, okay, let's think about this from a policy standpoint. There are approximate and immediate needs, but there's also this longer term piece that we have to think about, okay, what happens after the fact? Um, so, so I think that's, that's one of the things that I'm watching happen um, and engaging in is, is kind of how do we deal with what's, what's exposed uh, from a housing perspective, whether that's, you know, a question of, you know, people paying too much for rent, right? So um, over 75% of um, our low-income households are paying um, more than they should be for rent every month. So they're, they're, they're cost burdened, right? So you're only supposed to pay a third of your income for rent uh, every every month, right? For housing costs every month. month. Many of our families are paying well over that up to you know, above 50% of their income for housing. And so that means that no matter how great of a budgeter you are, um, if you were working at a restaurant and um, now you can only go in once a week, twice a week, maybe your wages have been cut, there's no way you're paying your rent. And so that has, that has cascading effects because while, um, the courts are shut down, so you can't actually, they, they're not hearing eviction cases. Evictions are still being filed and um, landlords are still assessing fee, late fees onto uh, people's rents. So they're just getting increasingly behind. Yeah, so I would like to pick up from Kate's point and she and I, um, I think both have already spoken a bit about the material concerns 
the physical concerns in terms of um, inequalities, in terms of who has stable housing, who is more likely, unfortunately, to both become infected and then experience a devastating infection in which they have to be hospitalized, intubated, where they might die, um, where they might die alone, um, which is a, a horrible um, fate for anyone. Um, and I think that we also have to think about some of the psychosocial and less um, uh, less material effects, um, but some of the real psychosocial concerns as well as educational concerns right now that hopefully policy will address in the future. So for example, inequities between who is able to stay home under work from home orders and be able to um, complete their work and also manage things like their children's education in a tele-education environment that is pretty much um, ubiquitous in, in many um, states right now. Um, so people who have relatively more privilege are probably more able to manage that and that maybe they have jobs with flexible hours, um, maybe their children already are obtaining learning outcomes where they can feel kind of confident about relaxing some standards around the home versus something like if you imagine um, you know, a single parent with a couple of kids who's facing concerns about, um, you know, whether or not to report as an essential worker and losing income, but reporting as an essential worker means exposing themselves to um, the risk of infection. Maybe they have a comorbid health condition where they know that the risk of exposure to an infection would um, make it more likely that they would have really a terrible exacerbation of disease. Maybe they're concerned about their housing, as Kate said, and then you layer on top up, that they're responsible for keeping up, you know, with three kids worth of, you know, Zoom meetings and compliance with all the assignments. It just becomes a psychosocial burden that really is inequitably distributed at this moment. So I want to mention that um, existing inequity. And then the other inequity that I've been thinking a bit about this weekend is kind of how we interact with green space and outdoor space, which is really a key component of mental health as well. I actually taught on this unit in my urban health course last week, and we were thinking a bit about how our ways of kind of resetting and gaining the mental health benefit of going outside are really changed by this current situation. We have stay at home orders, but as I was talking about with Kate before we began the official Zoom, I actually had my um, my daughter out. Hey, Orly, if you're watching, uh, I had my daughter out um, biking in the park this weekend and we were wearing face masks and trying to avoid other bikers, but there were plenty of people there who were not using the protective equipment that we've been advised to. Um, and there did seem to be a correlation with how fancy their bike was. This is, of course, not an exact science, but certainly the folks who were walking around um, maybe with less gear were uh, seemed more likely to be wearing, you know, protective face masks, et cetera. Um, and we can also see that in terms of um, how we think about um, how people feel comfortable going out in space following these best practices. So, for example, there was a lot of conversation among um among kind of thought leaders that when this mandate came out that we should be wearing homemade masks, that actually a lot of black and brown people did not feel that they could uptake that message because historically when they have worn masks, it's been viewed as a threat. And so there is this very well-meaning um, guidance in terms of well-meaning, in terms of microbes, but it fails to account for some of these social inequalities and social inequities, like how we are perceived in public and how um, some people are more capable of taking on the different um, components of venturing out of the house versus others. Sarah, you know, when you started talking about um, the, the, the difference in green space, my mind went somewhere completely different, which is another underlying uh, crack which is that, that many low income um, and minority communities don't have green space. And so where do you go to get out? How do you socially distance when you're lacking that? And that's, this is one of these interesting things. The Science Museum of Virginia did a really great study on um, heat island effect and mapped it across the city of Richmond and found a 15 degree difference between low income minority communities, particularly east end, north side, south side, and our West End white wealthier communities. And that 15 degree difference in real time actually feels like when you look at humidity between 20 and 25 degree differences, right? And so, right, you're, you're, you're in a space and that, that is directly related to the lack of green space, the lack of tree cover. Um, 
and that is sort of a, an inequality that's built into our built environment, right? We, we, we created these spaces, um, and I always like to call out Housing Opportunities Made Equal Home. Um, they do a lot of really great mapping of this, of this as well, and they look at access to green space, and it overlays with race, and it overlays with income. It overlays with access to uh, healthy food, so grocery store access, uh, as well as things like banking access. And so all of these things are tied up. And then when you overlay eviction, it's the same map. And you overlay historic patterns of discrimination, whether it's urban renewal or redlining uh, or highway construction, all of this has really big roots in our built environment. And, um, and it's, it's not just this, right? It's not just like, oh, wow, we have a racial disparity in COVID. It's, wow, all of these um, historic trends have created inequalities within our health within our uh, mental and physical health, within our incomes, within our access. And um, so we can't be really surprised at the um, equity implications for COVID. Absolutely. And you know, Kate, it occurs to me when you're saying that I framed this as this dichotomy between material effects versus like psychosocial effects, but the, the, it is well demonstrated in the scholarly literature that our um, psychosocial state of mind, that our well being affects our immune system. And so, if we are more capable of having access to the variety of supports that make us feel better, that as, as better as possible in COVID 19 adjusted um, terms, um, we are more capable of. Um, of fighting infection, for example. Um, so yes, to everything you just said. I also think that we cannot um, move past this question without calling attention to uh, the role of incarceration with mm -hmm. exacerbating inequality inequities that exist in our system. Um, currently, you know, there are a lot of concerns about outbreaks of COVID that have been evidenced in places um, such as Rikers that have not yet hit in um, Virginia's, um, in Virginia's, actually I did hear um, in, oh, forgive me which county it is, but there's a juvenile facility that I believe recently had 13 juveniles um, uh, uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, and this tracks along other kind of institutional settings like um, like elder care facilities, uh, like um, the Navy ship where there were 600 and plus diagnosed cases. And so when we think about inequities that result from different um, institutional settings, we have to um, attend to incarcerated populations needs um, and their human right to health and dignity um, in, a, in a terrible situation like COVID-19. Right, thank you. I'm gonna jump on what some of what Kate had mentioned. Uh, as the co-director of the RVA Eviction Lab, how is this pandemic affecting the evict evictions as well as homelessness in Richmond and then on a more um, national scale. So kind of touch, dive more deep into what you already have touched upon. Um, okay, so I'll see where we started because uh, I think this is always a good um, level setting uh, because some, some people may have sort of missed something that happened two years ago, which is that uh, Richmond ended up on the uh, list of top 10 highest evicting large cities in the country. Um, in fact, it was number two. Uh, five of the top 10 cities on that list uh, were in Virginia. Um, and so uh, that's really not the list you're like, you're really hoping to be on, right? You wanna be on the top 10 list of cool places to visit, not the top 10 list of places that are throwing people out their homes, right? Um, and so we were already in that space where our citywide eviction rate was around 11%, and that was sustained over the over about 16 years. So this was regardless of sort of various um, economic ups and downs, we were still uh, evicting people at high levels. And statewide, our eviction rate uh, was around five, a little over 5%. Nationally, that rate is around 3%. Um, so we were already in this place where we had a significant amount of churn and instability. Um, and so amongst our homeless population, uh, Homeward, who is our regional homeless store services coordinating uh, agency, they do a point in time count of, of homeless uh, individuals. And what they found was that um, uh, a quarter had been evicted in the previous year, and of those, 35% uh, had been evicted through an informal process, so they didn't go through the courts. So what this tells me is that we were actually, we're actually undercounting our uh, sort of eviction numbers. Hmm. Well, okay, so that's, that's, that's the, the, the place where we're starting. 
Um, and then um, in, I think, late March, uh, they shut down the courts in Virginia. So it meant that no, we were not hearing eviction cases. Uh, also in late March, the uh, federal government um, passed the CARES Act, which um, uh, put a moratorium on evictions for certain types of housing. And that is stuff that is funded through um, so federal subsidies. So your sort of formal things, uh, uh, whether it's low income housing tax credit or community development block grants or any other ways that we fund the development of affordable housing by private uh, entities. Uh, it also covers um, uh, insure mortgages. So anything that was that is insured through um, or supported through Fannie or Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, so that includes single family homes and multifamily housing. And um, so uh, that that sort of stopped the, the, the process there uh, for certain populations and certain buildings. Um, but as I said before, we're still seeing evictions, uh, still seeing eviction notices, and we're still seeing uh, fees. Um, so we're still seeing these things kind of um, build up over time. And so that means that right, essentially what's going on, if you're, if you're a tenant and you've lost all of your income, as we talked about, uh, because your, your uh, business was shut down, um, or you were furloughed, um, you say, okay, well, maybe I'll pay a little bit of rent or maybe I got won't um, because I don't have any income. Uh, then you can get, you, you, would, you would not pay your rent and then you wouldn't be evicted immediately because the courts aren't hearing it, but there would be a fee that would be assessed on that, a late fee on that. So then that means, you know, May 1st rolls around and not only do you have two months rent, you also have late fees on both that first month and then the collected rent of the second month. So essentially you have turned landlords into, and, and one of my, I'm stealing this from one of my students, you turn them into payday lenders because now there's this debt that there's no way that a, that a tenant can repay um, unless that they are requiring landlords to do payment plans and work with the tenants. Because when we come out of this, you know, there's, there, things are going to be different. The economy is not gonna bounce back immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in Virginia and other states have actually done uh, moratoria. They've, um, uh, done tenant-based rental assistance. They've done uh, a lot of other sort of policies to be proactive and say, look, we realize that, that, that this is going to be different. We realize that there's no way you can pay your rent. There's just, we've shut everything down. So there's just literally no way you can pay your rent. Um, but we haven't really been particularly proactive across the state. Um, and, and, you know, that's, I think, a little frustrating uh, because I think that we, um, we have the ability to do more in Virginia, and, and we really have the responsibility to do more. We started out in a place that was not stable for, for tenants, for renters, um, and we need to really sort of think about what kind of a state do we want, what kind of a commonwealth do we want coming out of this, and do we want somewhere that's even less stable than it was before, which is what I think we're looking at. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. I do have a, a question from Facebook. Uh, we have George B. This is for Kate. Can you please speak to the role of the eviction task force in combating the crisis? Mm. And then the second question is, are they serving as a coordinating entity or is there another organization taking the lead? That's a great question. So um, in November of 2019, um, Mayor Sony uh, called together the evictions task force. Uh, and this is a group of Pretty much anyone who's in the eviction space in terms of working so you have some organizers you have um, services providers anti-homelessness folks um, you have um, affordable housing providers uh, landlords um, it's really it's, it's quite a quite a mix of folks and, and um, Ben Teresa and I from the RBA eviction lab uh, also uh, were appointed for this um, task force um, but the task force has not met uh, since this crisis really took off. Uh, it's really not intended to be a coordinating space, although I feel like it probably could be. Um, it really was about trying to develop recommendations for the crisis as it was. Um, so in terms of those who've been um, thinking about this and trying to work on it within Richmond, I would say um, the Virginia Poverty Law Center, the Legal Aid Justice Center, uh, housing opportunities make equal. Uh, they have really been on the front lines of this, both sort of working with individual tenants, but also thinking through the larger policy pieces. Uh, they were working on this before it started uh, and um, have organizers on the ground. They have the, um, the Virginia Poverty Law Center runs the um, evictions helpline um, that actually has legal, legal services that are free and they, they work to connect, to connect uh, tenants to those legal services. 
Um, we have been working through the RVA Eviction Lab um, to make sure that information about um, what buildings are covered under the CARES Act was out early. So that was on our website. Uh, now other, other places have actually um, gotten a statewide, we've been a statewide look at that. So um, that information is definitely um, out and about and we're, we're working on getting that out further. So um, there's a lot of individual work, but um, it's, it's been tough to coordinate uh, largely because again, we really um, have, we have a lot of really great service providers. We don't have a lot of policy coordination uh, at, at, in Virginia on housing. That's a great question. Thank you, thank you, George. Um, so jumping over to Sarah, kind of focusing a little bit more on telehealth and healthcare. I'm um, going to start with an easy one. You were recently featured in an article on MarthaStewart.com, and you discuss um, which you discuss how we can how we can help at-risk populations stay healthy and safe. So do you have any tips for our viewers on how we as individuals can help others stay healthy and safe? Well, I appreciate your question and I'm gonna reframe it actually, which is that we as individuals can do our part to consider ourselves part of the collective to keep everyone healthy and safe. And, and I say that not to, um, not to try to edit you, but just to say that I think that it's valuable that we all remember that we are part of a total ecosystem in which we have an opportunity. And so that ecosystem might be our family. So for example, if we have people who are older in our family or have underlying health conditions that make them more vulnerable, et cetera. And then we kind of expand that outward to everyday, uh, to everyday people who we encounter in one way or another, whether it's at the grocery store, our Instacart delivery person, you know, the person we pass on the bike route, whatever. It's essential that we do everything we can to follow public health guidance to maintain this idea of flattening the curve. And so the basic concept of flattening the curve is to limit as best as possible the spread of disease, not only because we want to reduce the number of people who are ill overall, who become ill from COVID-19, but also because we want to limit the number of people who need healthcare services. So every one of us who is able to keep ourselves as healthy as possible is someone who keeps ourselves out of a healthcare setting and that frees up those needed resources to deliver people, uh, to, uh, care to people who are going to become more sick, who are going to need more resources. And so those activities are things like, you know, washing our, uh, you know, washing our hands, you know, making sure that we're, you know, wearing masks, making sure that we're, um, you know, changing our clothes when we walk in the door, if we have a lot of kind of high risk exposures, like, for example, you know, being in a medical facility, something like that. Um, but we can also do things to maintain the well being of those around us, whether it is, uh, you know, challenging this notion, notion that social distancing actually has to be social distancing. We can be physically distant from one another while also having social interactions. So just yesterday, I'll give you the example. My mom lives a couple of miles from me and she does drive-bys on the weekend where she stays out on the street and my daughter and niece and my sister and I do something. So yesterday was a fashion show. You know, we did a, we did a whole fashion show down the walkway outside, just doing things to kind of maintain our social connection while also doing best practices to maintain that physical distancing. And to this degree, you know, the weather's getting warmer. It's gonna become more desirable to be outside. Like I'll be feeling it as well. It is essential that we maintain our shelter in place or our physical distancing, even though it gets really, really hard when it's warm. Um, and that we especially um, not go, well, just this once, because every time we kind of just this once it, we kind of start getting those cracks in the edges and it makes us feel like, well, maybe I can do it once a week, you know, and then and then we start kind of like softening those edges. Um, and that's going to become really important to maintain a, a, a decline um, in infections and cases. Um, and so to that degree, we need to listen to sound science and listen to leaders who share sound science and actually refute leaders who um, share unsound science or personal perspectives that are not based on evidence. Thank you. Um, kind of jumping into telehealth, um, in March, the federal govern government broadened its coverage on so-called telemedicine services throughout Medicare. 
giving many more people access to a doctor over the web, which has been very helpful when people need to social distance and might not have the full effects of COVID and might not need to go to the healthcare kind of just like what you talked about, where we don't want to, if you have a symptom and you can use telehealth, um, you can figure out if you have something and you can stay home and you don't have to, those more serious cases can actually use the services that are available. But uh, technology makes those services accessible, but 30% of Americans still do not have internet. So what are some of the telehealth policies in Virginia, as well as national policies around telehealth? Yes, uh, this is a great question. And let me first just explain briefly why it matters that this conversation was driven out of CMS at the federal level. And so, you know, Medicaid services is really the driver for a lot of reimbursement norms. So far as what practices are covered in health, you know, they really kind of set a conversation that then, you know, private insurers and various health systems really have to um, kind of follow their lead in many ways. So the fact that uh, Medicaid section 1135 waivers rolled out in numerous states really created a reaction to COVID-19 that makes telehealth more robust versus where it had been kind of, I don't wanna use the word languishing, but I will use the word languishing um, to this point. And so the first thing that I'd like to say is that these telehealth waivers, we, um, many of us are hopeful are going to become, if not permanent, kind of long-term with the transition into some amount of permanence. Um, they cover home-based services, like you said, they waive facility fees, they cover um, over 85 new kinds of services. Um, and they also are being um, shared in uh, kind of emerging in the dental space, which is a really important space where they are often left out because um, many of the telehealth policies, actually uh, all, the majority of kind of conventional telehealth policies only cover medicine. And um, I want to say a quick hi on here to Chloe from the Virginia Health Catalyst, who I know is joining us today and who actually um, was one of the colleagues who helped me prepare for today's um, for today's responses. Um, some of the limitations of these telehealth policies really, um, as you stated, Lauren, are in implementation. So for example, in Virginia, um, actually just in January, there was a bill, Senate Bill 526, to strengthen broadband in rural communities, really bolster it, because broadband is a tremendous impediment to the optimization of telehealth. We're talking about those rural communities that maybe have never had adequate cable even set up, so the infrastructure isn't there, as well as urban communities where there's a um, real disparity in broadband access that is based more on finances. Um, and so there is this kind of, um, unfortunately, missed opportunity that we just had in Virginia with Senate Bill 526 to bolster broadband. I mean, obviously if it had passed last month, you couldn't build it right now immediately, but you could see down the pipe, you know, where, where you would be able to. Um, so certainly the disparities in broadband are gonna make implementation really highly varied. Um, also, um, at the same time, we're seeing some novel efforts in implementation right here um, at VCU. So um, VCU Health, um, actually led by a student in our HSEP program, Heron Dardinsa, who is also uh, the director of the emergency department of VCU Health, he and some EMS providers are teaming up to um, pilot telehealth in rural Virginia using EMS, um, kind of tele, using telehealth mechanisms to then communicate with VCU Health. So there are these kind of novel opportunities that are popping up to fill the gap that are um, certainly not long-term gold standard ideal because they're very much based on novelty, but they do um, demonstrate that creative thinking in this moment can really be an important way to fill these gaps um, that are uh, that are kind of structurally created. I also want to call attention really quickly to another barrier, which really has to do with patient privacy. So part of the premise of HIPAA, um, the Health Information and Patient Protection Act, um, is about patient privacy and ensuring the privacy of our patient health records. Um, However, uh, when we think um, of scenarios in patients' homes, I mean, I'm actually looking around my apartment right now. I live in, you know, it's one large kind of shared kitchen living room, my daughter's bedroom in one space, my bedroom in another space. 
where would I go to have privacy? Let's say that I was going to have something like a psych consult. You know, my daughter could hear through the wall, et cetera. That might not be a problem for me or a concern for me, but for someone for whom privacy is really important, especially when we think about, for example, someone who is living in a home with an abuser and, you know, is trying to reach out for services for psychosocial support, and they're using telehealth to try to connect with a mental health provider, but the person who is abusing them is in the home, you know, there are some real concerns about um, privacy. So those are just two of the issues that I wanted to mention, um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions to my best possible um, ability. I also want to give a shout out to the folks at the Center for Public Policy at the Wilder School and over in the School of Nursing, um, Shelly Smith and a bunch of other colleagues who helped me prep a bit for our questions on telehealth since that's slightly outside of my wheelhouse. Very good. Thank you. We'll jump in on this one again. I know I've been sort of harping on these kind of infrastructure pieces, but um, the broadband gap in Virginia has been well known for years, right? We've been, I mean, I, I worked on a report for the state um, probably four years ago with the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis at, at the Wilder School. And that was one of the things that would come up is, well, we, it was about economic development and housing and how do we sort of, you know, build what are, what are the problems? And I would call these planning district commission directors and they're like, you know, yeah, housing, yeah, housing, but I can't get broadband in my community. Once you're off 95, you can't get broadband and it costs so much. So we're never, you know, the folks in Northern Virginia are like, we're never gonna get people who are telecommuting from um, you know, jobs in the defense industry in Northern Virginia. We can't get folks to, who are um, you know, living, who are trying to commute from various other places. And, and so the broadband gap has been sort of well-documented. And I think we've been a little slow to actually proactively think about what it is that we need to have in place um, for preparedness, for, uh, for dealing with crises, whether they are um, about our social safety net or about our health. Um, or about our economic development, we really, uh, I think, I think that's one of the, maybe one of the lessons that could come out of this is thinking through, okay, so what, where are our gaps, right? It's like, it's like when we sort of allow our, our, our you know, bridges to crumble, right? You, you don't want to, you don't want the first time you really figure out that the bridge is crumbling, or you decide to deal with the bridge crumbling when it falls down. Yeah. Um, and so I think we've, we've sort of um, allowed the rest of our infrastructure, safety nets and set and whatnot, um, to crumble and now we're like, oh, oh yeah, they, oh that, yeah. I also, just a side note, I feel like a lot of students that are now at home, working from home and doing school from home need to have the internet and yes. not having that internet really can affect their learning abilities and learn, like being able to grow, develop, <coughs> and just, that just adds to it a little bit more. So not only telehealth, but also just being able to access internet to be able to access their schoolwork um, right. I'm sure has been a challenge for a lot of people. Right, because there, there's internet. There's the internet that you can check your email, maybe get on Facebook, and maybe a couple of you are doing that. Uh, and then there's the internet that allows you to do um, three Zoom calls at the same time um, and do synchronous lectures, right? So this, you know, we, we, we talk a lot as faculty members about synchronous sort of everybody all together or asynchronous lectures. And if you all have to be online at the same time, and there are two, three kids in the house plus two adults or one adult trying to do work, um, you know, we've all gotten that like, you know, your internet connection is unstable. Um, well, that's because we're all on at the same time. Um, and so if you are getting the bare bones internet because that's what's worked for a while to get you on a Google doc uh, and to check your email and all of a sudden your whole family is home, um, it's just not going to work, and so there's 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 inter there's a lot of different kinds of internet, right? They 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 price it so that you, so that you know which kind of internet you have, um, and so if somebody is streaming something uh, one place, uh, then it's going to impact everybody else who's trying to do something different. And I think that is a real huge gap, and and we um, you know we 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 treated internet like it's kind of a luxury. Um, but this isn't 1996, right? So uh, internet is not, right? I mean, you know, I remember when my, my computer at, at, at my university got ethernet, and we were so, uh, so shocked by it. Um, and, and that was, you know, the late 90s. Well, it's not, this is, it's no longer a luxury. We all need internet for our educational needs, for our professional needs. Um, and we have to, I think, start thinking about it as a utility rather than as um, something fun that we all get, like to get. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, moving on to the next question. I think um, we'll jump to more of a global question. Um, so this was a question that was fielded prior to our discussion. Um, are there any global laws or regulations that can be put in place so that information on deadly viruses can be shared before something like this happens again? Um, just like, for example, I think SARS and MERS were contained, they seem to be contained a little bit better, <laughs> just per se. Um, and we just had someone wondering why those were able to be more contained to their countries or to their regions than um, the coronavirus. So I'll let Sarah, you seem to be interested in touching upon that. I'll have you start. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the international health regulations of 2005 or IHR um, have been, excuse me, um, the international health regulations have been enforced. Um, so the IHR has been enforced since um, June 2007. It is, um, the aim of it is to prevent and protect against um, and control and provide a public health response to the international spread of disease um, in ways that are commensurate with um, public health risks. Um, but they're really a framework and they're entirely voluntary. Um, so they're managed out of the World Health Organization. It's the WHO's framework for epidemic alert and rapid response, but they're, voluntary and therefore they are really subject to country level response. And so as we can see right now, for example, in the US's kind of declining relationship with the World Health Organization, um, we can certainly envision another event in which, um, you know, if this kind of breach uh, moves forward, unfortunately, which I strongly oppose, um, that, you know, we would have a, an incentive not, for example, to report reportable conditions to the World Health Organization. And this may actually been have, have been what we saw with the China situation where, you know, um, the Wuhan um, cluster was not being reported um, in a speedy way. And even prior to that, with some of the reports that um, like, you know, the Navy's report to the federal government in November of 2019, which identified maybe some early possible cases, um, you know, were possibly not being shared with the WHO. And so really like with everything um, in global public health and really global diplomacy, there is a strong um, incentive structure set up, um, but a, but it's, it's majority, you know, voluntary participation. And so that is really why we don't have a, um, infrastructure that is a, a law per se or a regulation there are reportable conditions but the the premise of them is that countries have a strong desire and incentive to report really for their own good as well as everyone's good um and why we were able to contain SARS and MERS but not this is as much about the constitution of those viruses as it is about anything else so for example um SARS had a higher mortality rate, but its number of asymptomatic people was relatively low. So people were being kind of quickly identified and diagnosed, and that creates more of a containment strategy versus COVID-19, which as we're learning, just massive volumes of people walking around asymptomatic or at least asymptomatic for a period of time during which time they're infecting other people before they become symptomatic, something like that. Um, there um, is also a much lower, um, what's called an R naught, the, the, uh, the letter R uh, and a sub zero of, um, which means the replication. So, you know, how many people each person with a particular disease tends to infect with MERS, it was less than one. Whereas with COVID-19, it's in the two and a half um, range. So each person with COVID-19 on average infects about two and a half people with MERS. It was less than one. And so just not nearly as transmissible. Um, and so, you know, when we think about the, um, the reasons for the failure to contain this virus, um, many of them are about governance. The majority of them are about governance. But to be fair, some of them are also about the pathogen itself. Kate, do you have a response to that? No, I, I think uh, Sarah is more the expert in this area. Great, thank you, Sarah. It makes me feel like I know a little bit more about everything and how it all works. Um, so kind of going into 
that, Sarah, I'm going to touch upon how have policies impacted the health system's preparedness? So knowing that on a global scale, we kind of can voluntarily admit and talk and now we're moving to a more national scale and, and a, a regional scale. So how have policies impacted health system preparedness? Um, that's a great question. So um, in the past, really there was a pivot in terms of how healthcare systems kind of created expectations of patients to enter into the systems that really um, pivoted in um, the late 70s to really be a match between um, the number of like, let's say beds in a hospital or rooms in um, a non inpatient um, setup, like an ambulatory setup. The, the goal was to really kind of maximize filling those to reduce waste. And so part of that had to do with reducing the number of spaces. Um, and then part of it also had to do with technology. So for example, surgeries that used to be inpatient could be moved to outpatient facilities, which was actually great because it meant that people could go home sooner, they could reduce their susceptibility to healthcare acquired infections, et cetera. But in doing so, in creating this very strict structure where there was a goal to kind of use all the available space kind of optimally, it meant that there is very little wiggle room for an event like this. So one of the things that's supposed to backstop this lack of wiggle room is something like the National Guard or some other kind of um, massive service infrastructure that can come and build temporary settings for an event like this under some of the prevention framework um, from, you know, from the federal government. And part of that, part of the effectiveness of that really depends on identifying the pathogen earlier or, or, or early or identifying um, the event early, you know, whether it's another kind of event, whether it is, you know, pandemic disease or mass violence or like a chemical event, something like that. And then having a, a backstop situation like the National Guard come in and set up like a field hospital, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, um, because there was such a delay, really there was such a waste of a month's worth of time, really, um, between identifying the cluster in Wuhan, uh, really a waste of more like 10 weeks, um, you know, we have seen uh, over dependence on an existing healthcare system that is not prepared in terms of volume. And then, you know, I was also, so I teach public health emergency preparedness. And in that we, we talk about these events that are very kind of geographically located. So we work through, you know, Hurricane Katrina, we work through the Boston massacre. You know, we worked through um, uh, the Charleston, West Virginia chemical spill, and we worked through these case studies, and they're always kind of localized. So there's this idea that, um, you know, one unit from, let's say, maybe another, you know, area, another region where the National Guard is, can kind of pick up and then move over to that location and then plop down and help set something up. We saw this with FEMA, with Katrina, et cetera. Something that is overwhelming in this moment is that those puzzle pieces can't pick up and move because their own space still needs the coverage. And in some ways, we're seeing this emerging competition between states for vital healthcare resources because of a lack of federal coordinated effort. And so I think that um, one of the things that this event highlights is really when we think of preparedness the scale of our imagination has still always been limited. And all of a sudden we have this event where the scale just exceeds all imagination, basically. Um, again, which is why early containment would have been so important. But I should say, there's always an opportunity in these lessons, and some of the opportunities that I'd like to say, as I mentioned earlier, about, you know, telehealth, about something like in the dental space, something like silver diamine fluoride, which is a dental treatment that does not um, create aerosols, so it creates some opportunities to treat cavities without, like, creating lots and lots of, like, spit, basically, and blood in the air. You know, we've historically had these very inflexible workforce policies and norms, things like state licensure for clinicians, the overspecialization. We have the opportunity now as clinicians are pivoting to treat using tele in other states or to treat kind of outside their immediate specialty but in an adjacent one. We have these opportunities to make these things permanent changes and I certainly hope that we do. Very good. I think we have time for, I have one more uh, live question and then one more que final question. 
Um, so this, I think, will go for both of you, but maybe more Kate. Um, this is from Amy B. What are local organizations we can support that combat these growing issues? So I would say maybe all the growing issues from the telehealth, the medicine, and then the evictions and homelessness. So Kate. Uh, sure. Yeah, so, so we have a lot of responses, right? So there's um, these kinds of short-term responses uh, that are like emergency assistance for families. And um, so that's really, uh, really a, a big one. Uh, and I would definitely say, uh, you know, there's locally um, any of their homeless services organizations um, who've been kind of on the front lines, Caritas, Catholic Charities. Um, if you have any questions about how to, who, how to support uh, homeless services groups, call Homeward. They are the coordinating entity for this, uh, or policy-wise, and they, 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 have, they know who all the people are. Um, and quite frankly, you know, as we've done interviews with folks who are, have faced eviction, churches are, um, in many cases, the front lines. And um, they are the ones providing emergency assistance. So um, there's an organization of churches called ACTS, A-C-T-S. If you Google that, you should be able to find them. Um, and so that's one piece of the sort of emergency assistance that is if you're saying, you know, I just want to keep somebody in their home um, and, and, you know, maybe you've got your refund check or your, your, your stimulus check and you're trying to figure out where to go. Um, other organizations that are doing sort of long-term work, whether it's on the legal side or on the policy side, um, it's always housing opportunities made equal, the Legal Aid Justice Center, um, Virginia Poverty Law Center. Um, these are um, sort of uh, Legal Aid Justice Centers largely focused in Richmond, but Virginia Poverty Law Center home, they're focused uh, statewide. And so they're working on these issues, both sort of directly with families that are facing foreclosure and eviction um, and uh, longer term. Uh, so I think those are some great, great organizations because they're, they're really, um, uh, working directly with residents who are impacted by this uh, from a housing perspective, but also from a, from a human services perspective. Um, so I, I would definitely say that's that's really huge. Food banks right now um, are in absolute need, um, and I think that you know <laughs> you wouldn't go amiss uh, by doing a food drive or by donating money. Um, because these are definitely organizations that are, again, facing immediate needs because we really are talking about folks who are, it's not just eviction, it's actually food insecurity. Uh, and as Sarah can say better than I can, but um, you know, if you're food insecure, you're not, your immune system is not in a good place and your mental health is not in a good place. Um, and so um, just thinking through those basic needs, those are just a few, um, but that, those would be ones that I would start with in terms of the housing and human services side. Thank you. Sarah, do you have anything to add? I just second everything that Kate said. Okay, great. Um, and just a last question to wrap this up. What are some lessons that we've learned as a country and how can we move forward from the lessons that we've learned? So Sarah, do you want to start off? Sure. I mean, one of the first things that I think that we've learned is really how to come together in a crisis. I have been um, heartened every single day by seeing the cooperation among scientists, for example, scientists who have a very strong reason to want to be in competition for, you know, um, securing their careers, prestige, you know, income, all these, you know, genius awards, whatever. They are, you know, sharing data so prolifically that it really is, you um, extraordinary to watch and similar both kind of formal and informal mutual aid networks that have popped up um, among people who previously knew each other and were cooperating but also among people who are complete strangers but are you know somehow cooperating here and there so i think that one of the most important lessons to take away from this is that we are all connected and we can really take away that connectivity in a way that can inspire us to envision and create a new world that we want to see, a world in which people all have access to healthcare to enter into routine um, management of health conditions so that maybe they are stronger to face novel infections in the future. Um, you know, it's an opportunity to really think about um, you know, income disparity, you know, a lot of the calls about, um, a lot of the conversation about essential workers, you know, who is an essential worker and what are, what is their income should, is really kind of mapping onto some of the living wage. And we should 
really use our imaginations to think beyond that and think about dignity wages, not just equity, not just um, living wages. Um, and so I think we have a tremendous opportunity here that it will be shameful if we squander it to think about how our interconnectivity is actually not a um, vulnerability because while it does expose us to uh, pandemic disease, but it's really a strength that we have to build on to um, develop a new world. Yeah, I think I would second all of that. I, you know, the the coordination piece is huge, and um, you know, we had we've had folks who who have been you know coordinated or talking or whatever, but not in this way of like, okay, how did you find this information? And suddenly we're in these conversations with people across the country who are in fact dealing with the same kind of challenges from a, a housing for for us, obviously from a housing perspective or housing data perspective. Um, and that's been really uh, exciting and generative, right? I think that we, maybe, maybe the lesson is like that, in fact, it, you gain more by cooperating and thinking with a bunch of brains together uh, or, you know, much like a you know, sort of the proverbial barn raising, right? Um, you know, for a while, this is, this is, this is where, where, where my head is. But um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we, we think about that and do much better as a collective. And I think that is really a huge, huge piece to learn. Um, and you know, I think you know whether everyone's learned that or not. It's it's um, less clear. Um, and I think that you know that's one thing that we have to kind of keep hammering home is that we all uh, struggle. If some of us struggle, and this isn't you know I think to Sarah's point of the the, the transmittability of this this disease, um, it's not like you're going to be like, well, cool. I am holed up in my house, and I drive to the grocery store, and I want to go to Applebee's on a Friday. Um, well you're still going to be susceptible to the disease because you're not in a bubble and this disease is incredibly transmissible and um, I think I, you can't stress enough the impact of asymptomatic cases particularly among um, those under 40 which you know I, I, I split my time between um, Richmond and DC and in DC our, our um, peak of our age distribution is between 31 and 40 and everywhere else it's in the 50s and 60s and so that's uh, a lot of folks who would be asymptomatic and um, are at risk of transmitting it to others. And so not understanding that um, that important piece, I think, is still a, a piece that I hope that we learn um, and that it's not just about you. Um, and, you know, the other thing I hope that we learn, and, and I'm a little less, um, maybe I'm a little less hopeful than Sarah on this, <laughs> but I hope that we do learn um, the importance of infrastructure and that infrastructure is about our systems it's about, and, and, our, and our systems are um, policy systems and governance systems, their physical infrastructure and their social infrastructure. And um, I think that that's, that's, a, that's the piece we have to work on building. You don't just sort of like, you know, you, you, we, we didn't create a road network and then stop maintaining it. Um, we built a road network and we kept working through, we repave now and again, sometimes you tear the whole thing up again and, and restart. Um, and I think our, our policy systems are the same way, right? Um, we, 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 we've got to think about broadband. We have to think about housing supply. We've got to think about our tenant protections and our income protections. Um, we have to move beyond a charity mindset and think about an infrastructure mindset. And I think that's, we do really great charity work in Virginia. Um, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people are, are donors and they're, you know, you see big foundations uh, but that's not going to get us to a place that really um, prevents this in the future and actually changes and improves long-term outcomes for people. Um, and so I think that is, is a piece that I hope we start to understand. And I know it's a little bit deeper, and if you're dealing with immediate um, crises, it's, it's hard to kind of think past the immediate moment. But I think we have to sort of ask the bigger question, of like, why didn't this work? Not just, oh, it didn't work, and here's a way to plug it, but like, why didn't it work, and how can we make it work in the future? So that's my, that's my hope. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate both, appreciate both of you taking time out of your calendar to talk a little bit about everything going on. And I hope you both stay very healthy. I hope everyone watching also stays healthy and safe at home. Um, think about everything that was said today and kind of take action if you can, if you feel uh, called to do so. And again, thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Ability because while it does expose us to uh, pandemic disease, but it's really a strength that we have to build on to um, develop a new world.
Yeah, I think I would second all of that. I, you know, the, the coordination piece is huge. And, um, you know, we have, we've had folks who, who have been, you know, coordinated or talking or whatever, but not in this way of like, okay, how did you find this information? And suddenly we're in these conversations with people across the country who are in fact dealing with the same kind of challenges from a, a housing, for, for us, obviously from a housing perspective or housing data perspective. Um, and that's been really uh, exciting and generative, right? I think that we, maybe, maybe the lesson is like that, in fact, it, you gain more by cooperating and thinking with a bunch of brains together uh, or, you know, much like a you know, sort of the proverbial barn raising, right? Um, you know, for a while, this is, this is, this is where, where, where my head is. But um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we, we think about that and do much better as a collective. And I think that is really a huge, huge piece to learn. Um, and you know, I think you know whether everyone's learned that or not. It's it's um, less clear. Um, and I think that you know that's one thing that we have to kind of keep hammering home is that we all uh, struggle. If some of us struggle, and this isn't you know I think to Sarah's point of the the, the transmittability of this this disease, um, it's not like you're going to be like, well, cool. I am holed up in my house, and I drive to the grocery store, and I want to go to Applebee's on a Friday. Um, well you're still going to be susceptible to the disease because you're not in a bubble and this disease is incredibly transmissible and um, I think I, you can't stress enough the impact of asymptomatic cases particularly among um, those under 40 which you know I, I, I split my time between um, Richmond and DC and in DC our, our um, peak of our age distribution is between 31 and 40 and everywhere else it's in the 50s and 60s and so that's uh, a lot of folks who would be asymptomatic and um, are at risk of transmitting it to others. And so not understanding that um, that important piece, I think, is still a, a piece that I hope that we learn um, and that it's not just about you. Um, and, you know, the other thing I hope that we learn, and, and I'm a little less, um, maybe I'm a little less hopeful than Sarah on this, <laughs> but I hope that we do learn um, the importance of infrastructure and that infrastructure is about our systems it's about, and, and, our, and our systems are um, policy systems and governance systems, their physical infrastructure and their social infrastructure. And um, I think that that's, that's, a, that's the piece we have to work on building. You don't just sort of like, you know, you, you, we, we didn't create a road network and then stop maintaining it. Um, we built a road network and we kept working through, we repave now and again, sometimes you tear the whole thing up again and, and restart. Um, and I think our, our policy systems are the same way, right? Um, we, we, we've got to think about broadband. We have to think about housing supply. We've got to think about our tenant protections and our income protections. Um, we have to move beyond a charity mindset and think about an infrastructure mindset. And I think that's, we do really great charity work in Virginia. Um, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people are, are donors and they're, you know, you see big foundations um, but that's not going to get us to a place that really um, prevents this in the future and actually changes and improves long-term outcomes for people. Um, and so I think that is a piece that I hope we start to understand. And I know it's a little bit deeper. And if you're dealing with immediate um, crises, it's, it's hard to kind of think past the immediate moment. But I think we have to sort of ask the bigger question of like, why didn't this work? Not just, oh, it didn't work and here's a way to plug it. But like, why didn't it work and how can we make it work in the future? So that's my, that's my hope. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate, appreciate both of you taking time out of your calendar to talk a little bit about everything going on. And I hope you both stay very healthy. I hope everyone watching also stays healthy and safe at home. Um, think about everything that was said today and kind of take action if you can, if you feel uh, called to do so. And again, thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.